Hi, lovely little gemstones. It's Safira, and today I'm going to be reading A Game of Vice, Chapter 3, written by Coconut Cluster. Chapter 3, Brother Gothel. Roman knew there was a reason he always hated towers. Sure, he usually shrugged it off as a fear of heights, common enough to garner him as little pity as possible from the other sides, common enough to almost convince himself, even if a part of him crumbled at his dashing prince persona being tainted by such a phobia. Never mind the fact that he conquered cliffs and chasms and treetops with ease. Maybe, he'd think to himself occasionally, maybe he just happened to avoid towers. Maybe they just never crossed his mind when he created new landscapes and villages. And that's why every adventure he embarked on was blatantly lacking in such structures. It was a perfectly valid excuse, if he said so himself. And he was more than fine with pretending it was the truth until a better explanation forced its way to his attention. Well, guess what, Roman? He thought to himself now. The better explanation just kidnapped you and tied you to a chair. So much for a fear of heights. Could you stop moving around? You're distracting me. Remus hadn't actually been in the tower with him for long. Not consistently, anyways. When they'd first arrived there, he just shoved Roman and turned to the singular window in the room as his brother stumbled back into an almost stupidly well-placed chair, staying silent as Roman protested the ropes that appeared and wrangled themselves around his wrists and arms. A burst of fear struck Roman for the upteenth time that afternoon when he looked around got a glimpse of the landscape over Remus's shoulder and realized where they were, in Remus's twisted, shadowed side of the mindscape. He had little to no power here, no chance to simply will his binds away and summon his sword to fight his way out of his brother's godforsaken tower. After that, Remus had just glanced back, contempt sharpened his eyes and disappeared, the first of many times he'd done so since then. He'd at least been in a better mood when he returned the first time. His smile had returned, discomforting as that was. It served as a comfort to Roman that his brother was gleeful rather than cold and more unpredictable than usual. And he practically danced around the tower, whistling to himself as he messed with something behind Roman, something metallic that made a horrid screech as Remus dragged it across the uneven stone walls. They will come, Roman had called over his shoulder then, his voice just unsteady enough to make him sound more like a petulant child than anything. Though he wasn't sure how much faith he could put in the concern he'd seen in Deceit's eyes when Remus dragged him to the darkscape, he did have faith in the others to discover his disappearance and come find him, be it with or without the snake-faced side's help. They'll come for me! He'd been pleasantly surprised when Remus replied in a sing-song voice, in between those awful scraping sounds. They already have! His pleasure shriveled instantly as Remus appeared at his shoulder. Roman finally realized what the screeching came from, saw it in the corner of his eye as he was too paralyzed by the grinning presence just behind him to look at it directly. A long, thin sword, made of an oddly green material, scarred by dozens of tiny notches and stained at the end with something dark that made Roman's stomach turn. But the question is, Princey Pooh, how far will they get before they decide you're not worth it? Needless to say, he hadn't graced that with a response. Not because he didn't have an answer, of course. Obviously, he knew his family, his actual family, would power through whatever Remus threw at them. He just didn't want to give Remus the satisfaction of a response, obviously. Remus had disappeared again shortly after that, reappearing a few minutes later with his eyes narrowed, hands folded behind his back as he paced the small perimeter of the room. He muttered something to himself and made an odd motion with his hands, a gesture that inexplicably reminded Roman of the motions to Itsy Bitsy Spider as he stared on in confusion. And then Remus glanced out the window with a grin and disappeared as quickly as he'd come. Now, though, as he stood at the window with his back to Roman and his head low, Remus was more snark than sardonyx. I wouldn't be moving around if you just untied me, Roman mumbled, slumping as best he could beneath his restraints. The rope around his upper body, just above his elbows, wasn't awful to deal with, though it was tight enough that breathing had to be a shallow endeavor, but he wanted nothing more than to tug his sleeves down to give his wrists a reprieve from the merciless, pricking fibers that had been scraping at them for the past 45 minutes. Oh, but doesn't that just add to the aesthetic of it all? Remus said with a grand sweep of his arm, finally turning to face his brother, sunken eyes wide as he glanced around the room. Royalty trapped in a tower, simply agonizing for a brave knight to rescue them. He straightened up and gave Roman a haunty look. It's poetic. Roman just scowled. If that was an Into the Woods reference, I'm impressed, but mostly disgusted that you would use such a masterpiece against me. I'm simply heartbroken you don't like this, Roman, his brother continued as if he hadn't spoken. I tried so, Remus clenched his fist, so hard to appeal to your interests and keep you engaged. I thought you'd appreciate the Rapunzel tribute, but alas, <clears throat> Rapunzel doesn't get tied up. She does at the end of Tangled. Roman stammered for a rebuttal, but his brother had a point, so he just pressed his lips together and scowled some more. 
Besides, Remus continued, his gaze cold and even once more as he stared at Roman. Whatever he'd done after he disappeared last time left him stony now, much quieter as he paced, and it was clear Roman was hardly his first priority at the moment. Roman saw the sheath at his side as he strode past, saw the tentacle-like tendrils that curled around the hilt of his sword. The heavy, even footsteps echoing around the room pounded in his ears like a heartbeat. He really didn't like having Remus prowling out of sight. You're a romantic, Remus said, enunciating as if the word was dipped in poison. And wouldn't be oh so sweet to be rescued by a dashing knight? He made a good point, which Roman was reluctant to admit, so he just stayed still and listened though he did wonder who exactly Remus had in mind as his dashing knight. Not that he had a preference himself or anything. But something about his tone and the fact that the footsteps had stopped for a moment right behind him made the prince's stomach twist. There was a moment of silence, suffocating and depriving at the same time as Roman held his breath. Then the sharp clack of Remus's boots on the stone floor began again. I'm playing by your dull rules, princey, Remus spat as he continued pacing, finally reaching his spot in front of the window and spinning to face Roman eyes and words sharp. Fairy tales and knights and quests. Is that not what you want? Roman stared at him, watched the way he flung an arm out to gesture to the world beyond the window. The anger, the seething flame burning on Remus's face was not an expression Roman was used to seeing. His brother was always grim smiles or patronizing simpers or intense eyes that hid nothing and screamed mischief, if Remus wasn't screaming at himself. And when he was quiet, it was just to give time for his shock factor antics to sink in. There was no shock now. There was only ire and fear, wide eyes meeting each other with vastly different significance in the smothering silence as it fell between them. I made this game for you, Roman, Remus said, voice low and nearly spilling over with something that boiled and splashed too close to Roman for his comfort. To show you just how important and special and loved you are by your new little family. And yet you still think it appropriate to belittle my hard work? And Roman just swallowed his heart racing and eyes darting between Remus's face and the sword at his side as his brother's hand came to grip the hilt. It took him a good minute before he finally heard what Remus had actually said. Your new little family. Oh, he said stupidly. He'd nearly always chalked Remus's actions up to his inherent unpredictability, his need for chaos and delight and tension. He'd never considered that it was his own fault that Remus felt the need to lash out. This, of course, went a bit beyond lashing out, but he and Remus always were a tad extra. Of course, from his perspective, it would seem as if Roman had abandoned him and left him to the dark sides, even if Remus got a long swell there. Roman had found his place with the others, kept his brother hidden from Thomas's attention just as they did with Deceit and even Virgil, back before he became more prominent, more essential. He'd shoved Remus as far away from Thomas as he could, he was desperate for his other half, his grotesque and irreconcilable reflection, to remain a shadow and keep himself in the spotlight of Thomas's priorities and focus, even if it meant keeping Remus out of his own focus, too. He couldn't very well refute Remus's points. Roman was ashamed of him, as awful as it sounded now that he admitted it to himself, and he did his best to let his existence go unacknowledged on a daily basis. But there was a spark of what he hesitantly deemed sympathy in his chest. And as much as Remus could be a detriment, Roman was ashamed of himself as well. Remus, he said quietly. His brother hadn't shifted his gaze while the prince thought, nor did he soften at Roman's tone now. I'm sorry. I've never even thought about it from your perspective. I didn't realize how much that must have hurt you. This was the moment with the others, Patton or Virgil or even Logan, where they'd both go quiet, contemplative and their voices would be soft as they came to a mutual concession of value or merit or whatever they had gotten into a scuffle about. They'd give a small smile to each other and they'd chat and throw a joke to cheer themselves up, to remind them that they were allies and friends at their core, and that the future was full of compromise and respect and warm regards. Apologies were difficult, and to extend a sincere one was a gesture that went openly appreciated. But Remus was not one of the others. His gaze was blank, dead-eyed, as his fingers curled around the tentacled hilt of his sword, white knuckles betraying his cold front. Roman shrank back in his seat as his brother pulled the sword from its sheath, winced with a shiver down his spine when Remus dragged it along the ground behind him as he took slow, deliberate steps towards the prince. The click of his boots against the uneven stone echoed in Roman's head like gunshots, again and again until he wanted to press his palms over his ears and squeeze his eyes shut, and hope beyond hope that he was somewhere else when he opened them again. But his eyes were open, wide and sharp with the threat of tears and trained helplessly on his brother, who finally stopped a few feet from him, head high and face unreadable. Rem 
Roman managed through the fear clawing its way up his throat. I'm willing to talk about this. Remus finally smiled, and Roman had never seen something more dreadful. How chivalrous, his brother said quietly. How honorable. The smile bordered on a sneer, a subtle ridiculing blade in his voice that cut Roman to his core. You've always had the option to talk, Roman. But guess what? Sickly sweet now, dripping with enthusiasm and something scathing and acidic, grin wide enough for Roman to see Remus's canines. It's my turn to pick now, and that option isn't available anymore. Roman swallowed and opened his mouth to respond, but just as he went to push out a plea, there was something blocking it, a cloth tied around his head and between his teeth. He choked on the sudden gag, a tear finally falling from his squeezed shut eyes as he coughed and struggled to pull in an even breath. As he finally righted in his seat, chest heaving and vision blurry with the rest of his tears unshed, Remus just watched him, a grim shadow of that smile still lingering on his face. The panic blazing through Roman's chest doubled as his brother lifted his sword and pressed its stained tip to the prince's throat. These may be your rules, Remus started with what Roman could only guess was delight. Princes and rescuers and fantasy and whatnot, but it's my game. Chin up now, Roman. He gave an exaggerated grin and pushed the tip of his sword harder. A drop of warmth trickled down Roman's throat until Roman returned the smile, or a shaky excuse for one, from behind his gag. We're having fun! He dropped his sword, tucking it neatly back into its sheath with a firm nod of his head, seemingly satisfied. Now, if you don't mind, he said, eyes flickering from Roman to the rest of the room, as if admiring his handiwork, I have a bespeckled adventurer to put to the test. And he was gone. Roman stared at the now empty spot, his eyes finding nothing but pale, scraggly lines, scars from Remus's sword across the stony floor. Another shot of panic scored his chest as he took in the phrase bespeckled adventurer. He hoped it wasn't Patton, although the spider emotions from earlier didn't bode well now. And though he knew Logan could handle himself against Remus, he wanted the logical side to avoid Remus's provocations all the same. But it was dull with shock and the numbing effect of overwhelmedness as his gaze drifted to the landscape beyond the window. He saw trees gnarled in black, a pallid gray sky stained with patches of charcoal, dark spots that foresaw a storm. Above all, ironic, he saw an emptiness that spanned before him, a lack of life in the altitudes Remus had dragged him to, the spine-tingling fear he'd felt all those times when his mind slipped during a quest in his side of the imagination, when a single looming structure forced its way into his adventures and nightmares alike, crawled up within him now, forcing the wall of unshed tears from his eyes at last. He was trapped in a tower, and he was utterly, undeniably, and suffocatingly alone. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss any of my future videos. And if you like what you hear and you want to read more, you can find the link to the fic in the description. See you next time!